our scripture for today continues to unfold uh, the events of that Pentecost Sunday in Jerusalem when the church was born. This morning, a few more verses as we hear from Peter, who stands in front of the crowd and offers them some insight into this new chaos of the Spirit. I'll be reading words in yellow and invite you to read a lot together, those in white. And Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I said. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, no this, this is, is what was spoken, spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. For those uh, people in the life of the church around the world who continue to think that uh, somehow God favors men, I offer today's passage. I find it interesting that Peter chose to pick up on Joel's prophecy. It's been centuries since Joel would have spoken those words and they would have been repeated in synagogue and they would have been discussed wherever learned men among the Jews would have studied. He was one of the minor prophets and he did offer this hopeful vision of a day when the Spirit would reignite the imaginations and the passion of God's people. Peter must have made that immediate connection that whatever was happening to him and his colleagues, this new spirit, this new energy, this new passion, this new courage to rush out into the streets and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ must be some fulfillment of that dream and vision of Joel's. But it starts off and repeats later this concept of in the last days, in those days. This will happen. The last days. And it makes me wonder if that's what Peter must have thought, that this new spiritual revival that he saw in himself and in his colleagues was the evidence of a soon-to-be change in all things. That these were indeed the last days being ushered in. We know the Apostle Paul in at least 30 years of his ministry thought the same thing. That Jesus would be returning and it would be within the lifetime of those who had witnessed Jesus on earth. The last days. We know they misinterpreted misunderstood, they just plain got it wrong. That for those who were looking for a physical, literal, historical end of the world, it 
wasn't going to happen in their lifetime, not in the first century, not in the first three centuries, not in the 20 that, that followed the days when Jesus walked the earth. These last days, and, and yes, there are certainly still people who prophesy them, who foresee them. The end of the world is coming. Go and stock your shelves. Buy some survivalist stuff to store in your bunker. Repent and be prepared for the last days. They start a fervor, which should be incredibly easier in these days of texting and internet. And someone undoubtedly writes a book for telling the coming of the last days. There were at least a dozen pretty prominent dates in the 20th century. The last days are coming. And I suppose someday somebody will be right. <laughs> but perhaps it's much more important for us to have eyes to see our own times and to be prepared to face last days of a different sort. The kinds of last days many of us have already faced in so many ways. The difficult last days. Perhaps for many of us the last days we spent with a parent before they pass to go to God. Perhaps the last days we spent with a child before they moved away to college or before they were married or moved halfway across the country. Perhaps the last days of a relationship. One that we knew was coming to an end. One that we should have known was coming to an end. One that we were totally blindsided when it came to an end. The last days. Each of them, in all those varieties, in all those moments in our lives, felt like the end of the world. And many of us were shattered and crushed and crying knowing, not just wondering, not just thinking, but knowing that life will never be the same again. It's never the same again. People who tell us that are selling us something. Loved ones pass. And life will never be the same again. Children grow up. And life is never the same again. Relationships end. Careers end. Health fades. And life is simply never the same again. Given the reality of the challenges that we face and how devastating they can be to us, I'm floored that people of faith worry about the end of the world when we face it all the time. And I personally don't need a lot of assurance of God's faithfulness when Armageddon comes. I need assurance of God's love and grace. I need the comfort of people of faith when my world comes to an end. I need someone to hold me 
through the crossroads. I need someone to reassure me that they will be there through the devastation. I need someone to love me like a father or a mother. To hold me like a dear friend. And to let me feel the pain and let me cry the tears. And to hold me when I simply can't hold it together anymore. The church was not born to prophesize the end of the world. It was created so that we might be filled with the Spirit and able to comfort and encourage each other and others around us when their world comes to an end. And everything changes. And the chaos overwhelms them. And the fear and anxiety is devastating. And their faith falls into doubt. Sadly, all too often, the faithful have been quick to shake a finger at those who are devastated. And to question the value of those who have doubt. And to simply disregard Dismiss, disown those who in their fear and pain run and hide. It seems to me this Pentecost spirit that gives life to the church boldly sends us out into the midst of human reality where we can engage people as their worlds come to an end where we can stand there with grace and love and not judgment not blame not disappointment but as the very representatives of a God who loves us through all pain. I've experienced moments in my life when people have held me through the pain. I've experienced moments in my life when no one did. But God. And I've seen countless times when people of faith around me rallied around the devastated and offered their assurance to those who had lost their world and who offered at least the one gift when all else seemed lost, the one promise, the one hope that though everything changes, my love for you will not. That realization with Enos that Peter must have had that the Spirit is changing things and is at work in me and each of us at our own times have been able to go to someone somehow believing that we were God sent just to love them through the Those are the moments we live for. Those are the moments in which we are alive. Those are the moments in which the Spirit of God is full and flourishing and moving through us. Those are the moments we were born for. Somehow, O oh God, you have made your presence known to us. Perhaps in the 
beautiful sunlight and a perfect morning. Or in the way a song touches our soul. Or the way a loved one holds our hand. And the way the words of scripture come to life. And the way that bread and cup remind us of your complete commitment to us. And we are grateful, O God, for the ways in which these people around us and those who have come before us have reached out in our last days and helped us hold on until the new day began. When hope was restored, and spirits were refreshed, and souls were healed, and we discovered that the life would never be the same again, it could still be glorious. It could still be filled with love and grace. It could still be a great and powerful blessing, a joy to experience. Continue, O oh God, to help us find those moments in our lives and to be grateful, to help us find the opportunities to let your spirit move through us, that we might indeed be a Pentecost people, restoring lives as you move through us. In Jesus' name.